what a dog, what a dog. She's not a tramp, but she sings a swinging jazzy tribute to one. Peg is sultry, smooth, and has obviously had her heart broken one too many times. Who brought voice to this veteran lover? Let's find out. Before we start, don't forget to check out our Discord, our Patreon, and like, subscribe, comment, hit the bell, all the things. It really helps us out. Peggy Lee, originally named Norma Dolores Eggstrom, was born in Jamestown, North Dakota in 1920. Obviously the most old-timey sentence we've said here. She moved a lot as a child and eventually ended up in Wimbledon. She lost her mother when she was four, and the rest of her childhood was challenging. Her father, the town's railroad depot manager, was an alcoholic. And he really at times couldn't run the depot, so she would have to take over for him. Worse still, her father remarried a woman who was physically abusive. Lee later wrote that her stepmother once beat her over the head with a cast iron skillet. Your stepmother was very brutal. Yes. Yes. It became a way of life. You'd get a beating? Mm-hmm. Or anything. And, uh, I'd say it toughened me up. I, I've often referred to it as boot camp. Despite these hardships, Peggy's natural talent for music still found ways into her life. There was a young man that used to ride by my house. And uh, it wasn't my house. It belonged to my parents, uh, but by my home, shall I say. And he had a, a pony. He had two passions in life. One was me. He used to bring me Babe Ruth candy bars and yeah. sweet pea perfume. And, and he put them in my desk. And I was terribly embarrassed because I was much too young for that. Oh. And I didn't know how to graciously accept those gifts. but. He had a, a wonderful horse, and that was his other passion. He used to put uh, all kinds of trappings on the bridle and everything. And he would ride by my home, and this is what I would hear. Yes, sir, that's my baby. No, sir, I don't mean anything. In high school, Lee was the female singer for a six-piece college dance band where she traveled to various locations on Fridays after school and on weekends. Peggy's first professional engagement was in 1936 on KOVC Radio in Valley City. She later had her own 15-minute Saturday radio show sponsored by a local restaurant that paid her salary in food. Does that count as being paid under the table or on the table? I'll be here all week, folks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm being told I will not be welcome back here. Well, thanks, everyone. During and after her high school years, Lee sang for small sums on local radio stations. This led to an audition at one of North Dakota's biggest broadcasting stations, Waday. I'm sorry, that's W-D-A-Y in the town of Fargo run by Ken Kennedy. You have to change your name, Kennedy told this 17-year-old aspiring singer. Norma Eggstrom doesn't sound right. You look like a Peggy. Peggy Lynn. No, Peggy Lee the singer wrote in her 1989 autobiography, Miss Peggy Lee. She moved to California in 1937, where she took a job as a waitress while trying to break into the music business. But a bout of tonsillitis took her back to North Dakota. When she recovered, she got a regular gig singing in a Fargo hotel before taking to the road again. When Lee returned to California in 1940, she took a job singing at the Dollhouse in Palm Springs. Here, she developed her trademark sultry purr. That's dog purr, not cat purr. Having decided to compete with the noisy crowd with subtlety rather than volume. Basically, the jazz room equivalent of when the teacher tells her noisy class, I'll wait until everyone's quiet. Still waiting. Yeah, Mrs. Woodley, like that ever actually works. You gotta yell at the kids. They're kids. I knew I couldn't sing over them, so I decided to sing under them. The more noise they made, the more softly I sang. When they discovered they couldn't hear me, they began to look at me. Then they began to listen. As I sang, I kept thinking, softly with feeling. The noise dropped to a hum. The hum gave way to silence. 
I had learned how to reach and hold my audience, softly, with feeling. While performing at the Dollhouse, Lee met Frank Baring, the owner of the Ambassador East and West in Chicago. He offered her a gig at the Buttery Room. Yummy! It was a nightclub in the Ambassador Hotel West, though, and not a place where they put butter on the floor so that you can skate around on the floor like everybody would think. Oh, am I the only one who thinks that? Uh, okay. There she was noticed by band leader Benny Goodman. They were looking for someone to replace Helen Forrest. Right. And that was hard to do because she's a lovely singer. And uh, so she told Benny that there was a girl downstairs that they were staying there. And it was just before they got married. She was still Lady Duckworth. And uh, that's how it happened. Yeah, you were he, how old then? 17, 18? Uh, 17. And I, there was a phone call. And do you know Leonard Feather? No. Well, he's a famous jazz right. critic. And um, his wife was my then roommate. And uh, I refused to return the call. I thought somebody was kidding me because I was such a big fan of Benny. And uh, finally she said, it really was Benny Goodman. Yeah. So I, I finally returned the call and he said, would you yeah. join the band? She joined in August 1941 and made her first recording singing Elmer's Tune, which was not a song where Lee did her best impression of Elmer Fudd singing about that wascally rabbit, as everyone would assume. Oh, I'm the only one who would assume that? Okay. What makes a lady of 80 go out on the loose? Why does a gander meander in search of a goose? What puts a kick in a chicken, the magic in June? It's just Elmer's Tune. Oh, really? I'm the only one who thinks that. Really? Nobody thought that was about Bugs Bunny? Elmer's tune? Right. Lee underwent a baptism of fire with the so-called King of Swing. She was expected to perform with the band without any prior rehearsal. Luckily, she already knew Goodman's repertoire, and two days after joining, was taken into a Chicago studio to make her recording debut. Jeez Louise. Though she was thrown in the deep end, Lee survived and went on to front a swath of hit singles with Goodman, including Somebody Else Is Taking My Place. My heart is aching, soon we'll be breaking, for somebody's taking my place. And Why Don't You Do Right, which sold more than one million copies and made her famous which I found with Lil Green, who wrote that. I think she wrote it. And I used to play it constantly. And Benny uh, was tired of it. <laughs> and he said, you really like that, don't you? And I said, yeah. ah, yes, I do. And uh, so he said, would you like to sing it with the band? So he had an arrangement made. And uh, I thought it would be a smash immediately, and it wasn't. So they held it till the record ban, and it happened to come out as one of the two last things that left in the bank. You had plenty money, 1922. You let other women make a fool of you. Why don't you do right, like some other men do? Wait, haven't I heard that song somewhere? Why don't you do? Peggy also performed in two films with Benny, Stage Door Canteen and The Powers Girl. The crocodile tears are falling from her blue eyes. Did she hurt her pretty finger? Or do her eyes just smile? Or could it be that possibly she stumbled a little and broke her heart? Benny was uh, very nice to me. Again, I think he thought of me as his little sister or something. Because he gave orders that none of the musicians were to come near me. No fraternizing with the girl singer. This no fraternizing rule became a problem when Peggy fell in love with guitarist Dave Barber. Just like Romeo and Juliet, without Romeo having to murder Juliet's cousin. Dave was promptly fired, and soon after Peggy quit. In 1943, Lee married Dave Barber, 
but her recent fame led to tempting offers that she eventually turned down. Yes, I didn't. I never wanted to be a star. Yeah. I wanted to sing around the house and uh, paint and write and raise babies and uh, those kind of things. I, I had tremendous offers. I had already quit and retired. <laughs> and, uh, and I would be scrubbing a floor or doing some you know, washing or cooking. And the telephone would ring in these tremendous offers. And of course, I think I must not have been in my right mind, but <laughs> <laughs> actually I was very happy. And uh, I just said, no, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be a housewife. Eventually, her husband joined the voices, urging her to continue her career. So in 1943, she drifted back to songwriting and occasional recording sessions for Capitol Records. She began her long Capitol Records career as part of an all-star jazz album. In late 1945, Capitol signed her to a solo contract and she hit the charts with her first shot, waiting for the train to come in. Lee continued to score during the late 40s with over two dozen chart entries before the end of the decade, including It's a Good Day, Manana is Soon Enough for Me, and I Don't Know Enough About You. Many of her singles were made in conjunction with Barber, her frequent writing and recording partner. Adorable. After moving to Decca in 1952, Peggy Lee starred in a remake of The Jazz Singer. This is a very special day. The breeze took the clouds all away. It swept the sky like a broom and got ready for a very special day. While at Decca, she released her most celebrated album, Black Coffee which features in many jazz lovers' top 10 album lists. Black coffee Since the blues caught my eye Shout out to all the jazz lovers. During the early 50s, she hosted her own radio show, often showcasing composers she loved, including Johnny Mercer, Hoagie Carmichael, Matt Dennis, and others. In 1955, she played an alcoholic blues singer in Pete Kelly's Blues alongside Ella Fitzgerald. Sugar, I call my baby my sugar. I never made my sugar. That's why my baby is so. This performance earned her an Oscar nod with a nomination for Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. From there, she went on to prove herself as a triple threat, singer, actress, and dog. In the early 50s, Disney was looking for an outside composer for Lady and the Tramp. He hired Peggy Lee and partnered her with Sonny Burke. You probably know Peggy Lee as a singer and an actress. But Peggy is also a talented lyricist, so she and Sonny Burke, the well-known musician and composer, were called in on the problem. Uh when Sonny Burke and I were doing the score for the movie, uh, we would do demo records for him and for the artist to do the uh, uh, animation. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, Mamie Eisenhower was our first lady, and there was quite a controversy in the country about uh, the bangs that she wore. That everyone wanted her to try to change the bangs. And um, the dog, in the script, originally it was called Mamie, and she had bangs. So Walt asked me if I would mind being called, uh, uh, if the dog could be named after me, and I said I'd consider it an order. Well, it may as well have been called Peggy, because, I mean, it was your voice. It's your voice on all of those songs. Yes, that was an accident, too, Alan, because uh, we, we brought in the, um, the demos, you know, just mm. to show them, and, and Walt said, would you do the voices? I didn't realize at the time that I was helping create the characters because I sang the demo records for the for Walt and the animators, um, and didn't realize that I was a part of a long, ongoing, wonderful film. Mother was delighted to be asked to work on anything for Walt Disney because she had great respect for him and with somebody of the stature of Sonny Burke. Now this is exactly how I saw them working 
at yes. our house. That's right. We'd hear the piano playing down below, and we would sneak to the banister, and you could hear the songs from Lady and the Tramp as they were being created. Are you ready? I saw. Proceed. Unforeseen addition to the movie. Yes. And they had really almost done what they were going to do before they hit on the idea of having a character named Peg. Oh, she was so delighted with it. She really had fun with it. What a dog. Peg in the movie vamps it up, picking Absolutely. up on all the cues from your mom. He's a tramp, but they love him. Breaks a new heart every day. He's a tramp, they adore him, and I only hope he'll stay that way. He's a tramp, he's a scoundrel, he's a rounder, he's a cad. He's a tramp, but I love him, yes, even I have got it pretty bad. You can. What's the most satisfying lyric in that movie to you? I'd say maybe Bella Notte, where they're having spaghetti. So I like the romantic thing. She also performed the part of Mrs. Darling. No, not that one. There we go. La la loo, la la loo, little soft, fluffy sleeper. Here comes a pink cloud for you. After five years at Deco, she returned to Capitol Records where she distinguished herself through recording a wide variety of material, including songs and occasionally entire LPs influenced by the blues, Latin, cabaret, and pop. Never know how much I love you. Never know how much I care. And in 1958, Lee had her biggest hit with Fever, with an arrangement all her own. Just bass, drums, and finger snaps. Fever when you hold me tight. She's keeping so much in. If this is the only thing to signal what you're singing about, that's powerful. Lee also used many different settings, like an orchestra conducted by none other than Old Blue Eyes, the king himself, Frank Sinatra, for 1957's The Man I Love, the George Shearing Quintet for 1959's live appearance Beauty and the Beat, Quincy Jones as a ranger and conductor for 1961's If You Go, and arrangements by Benny Carter on 1963's Mink Jazz. She continued to perform through the 70s. While Lee was in London for a 1970 engagement at Royal Albert Hall, she invited Paul and Linda McCartney to dinner at the Dorchester. At the dinner, the couple gifted Lee with a song they had written entitled Let's Love. In July 1974, with Paul McCartney producing, Lee recorded the song at the record plant in Los Angeles and it became the title track for her 40th album, her first and only on Atlantic Records. In 1987, when Lady and the Tramp was released on VHS, Lee sought performance and song royalties on the video sales. When Disney refused to pay, she filed a lawsuit in 1988. 
and I've almost gotten a law degree out of <laughs> reading all. Now these. you think you're going to prevail? Yes, I. I believe. You know, it. you think you'll get some money from it in the end? Why not? I well, have a contract. Right. You had a contract, and what you I said was that they contract. had to get your permission to. Yes. To release it. Anything for sale to the public, that was uh, a transcription for sale to the public, yeah. and that it was two point four million dollars. Not a lot of money to them. What are they no, worried it about? Isn't. It's ridiculous. I mean, Michael Eisner makes uh, fifty million a year uh, for his He's salary. He's made a lot of money from stock options and the rest. Right, plus all the perks. Right. And uh, I think uh, Jerry Katzenberg does the same. Jeff Katzenberg. Jeff, excuse right. me, uh, Jeff. Well, they all made a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you know, it's uh, that that old yeah. thing about you can't take it with you, but I want to leave some for my children. <laughs> yes, you do, and everybody yes. should. After a prolonged legal battle in 1992, Lee was awarded $2.3 million for breach of contract. Lee continued to perform into the 1990s, sometimes using a wheelchair. After years of poor health, she died of complications from diabetes and a heart attack in 2002 at the age of 81. Yes, and you know, when you're interpreting songs, well, at least it's true for me, that I, I go back and uh, relive some of those things. I don't literally relive them, but I understand what people go through uh, because I've been through it. So therefore, when you sing those lyrics, you think of your own pain or your own joy or your own experience that act gives you the power mm -hmm. to, to interpret it with more force and, yes. and inflection. And Despite her own ambitions to be a family woman, Peggy Lee's talent allowed her to share her gift with the world. Over her lifetime, she recorded over 1,100 songs, 270 of which she co-wrote or wrote herself. Among these were her beautiful songs for Lady and the Tramp that will live on in our hearts and minds forever. But I wish that he were double, he's a tramp. He's a rover, and there's nothing more to say. If he's a tramp, he's a good one, and I wish that I could travel his way. Wish that I could travel his way. Wish that I could travel his way. Thank you to these people for supporting us on Patreon. And if you want to make sure this channel sticks around, you can check out the Patreon link in the description. Every bit helps. Thank you for watching this episode of Dizographies. Click the thumbs up button below if you liked it. And if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, consider subscribing and hitting the bell. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked below. We hope to see you in another Dizography. Yeah.